Are you looking forward to that homecoming? My goodness, we just uh, we just got another gift, another song to sing all week long while we're uh, going here and there. Oh, oh, oh. We do that. man, what a homecoming! What a great, what a great message and song. Uh, glad to see all of you here, and if you uh, wouldn't mind, please join me and let's turn to the letter, God's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. It begins, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, and then a dash. A dash is God stopping him. We talked about that last week. Some of you are worried about me. You're thinking, he's going to preach the same sermon again this week that he preached last week. He has got dementia or something. He, and it's, it's likely that that would happen. But i got to tell you, there are sermons that need to be preached more than once uh, in, a, in, a, in a following week. You know, if, we're not, if we're not obeying what the Lord told us last week, why did we get to have another message this week, right? Well, he, God interrupted Paul, Paul was ready to move on to verse 14, but God said, no, you have not fully explained the new racial unity that we have in Christ. Verse 15 of chapter 2 said that we have one new humanity. Verses 19 through 22 says that now we're citizens of the same people, members of the same family, stones of the same temple, filled with the same Holy Spirit. Man, this is good. This is so good. This is sermon five of this little sub-series that we began in chapter 2, verse 11. I can't believe I preached five sermons on this. Some of you are like, yeah, you did. You preached five sermons on this. But I want to tell you that I've never believed anything more strongly that this world needs to hear than this message right now. It really does. So please endure with me one more time as we go back to these verses. Last week, we, we covered one-third of the content in these verses that, that, uh, that needed to be pulled out. We're going to deal with the other two-thirds today and move on to chapter 14 uh, uh, next week, God willing. But I want to tell you that, that we need this. We need this because God's enemy, the devil, is trying to rip the world apart. And he's trying to rip God's people away from himself. Race is one of the areas where the devil has a strong foothold. And with race and racism, there's a lot of sin for him to work with. When there's sin, he has an opportunity. It's like a handle for him. It's a foothold for him. He can, he can grab us where our sins are, the devil can. And, and so when it comes to race, you think about all the sins that are wrapped up in that topic. Prejudice, unforgiveness, self-loathing and feelings of worthlessness and envy. The two great commandments that God gave us are being shredded by racism and these issues, you think about that. What are the two great commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And love your, as you love yourself. The sin of racism is a revol- uh, the sins regarding racism are revolving and self-perpetuating. Because you have these hateful things that are done out of just pure wicked racism, and then you have the bitterness and the hurt and the unforgiveness that comes and and possibly even retaliation. So you have this cycle now that's spinning and spinning and spinning and digging deeper and deeper and deeper into our society, into our hearts. It's pretty awful. But Jesus said that truth will set you free and my word is truth. He can set us free from that self-perpetuating, revolving sin. In this area, he also said that he would build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We need to keep that in mind as we read these verses again. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. Ephesians 3, 1 through 13. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles... Surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation as I have already written briefly. In reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by my spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. 
This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my suffering for you, which are your glory. Let's pray. God, we are so thankful for this day, and we're thankful, Lord, for this message. This message of inclusion that, honest to goodness, it brings us in. We are the recipients of this message, and so, God, we're so thankful for your grace, for your forgiveness, for your allowance, and your invitation to come. We praise you for your goodness and your great love for us, and that while we are still sinners, you died for us, and God, how great a thing that we might be called your children. Oh, God, we pray now that you'll, we'll hear you as you speak these words of your mystery, and Lord, we pray, Lord, for those that don't know you as Savior and Lord. By way of the broadcast or here in the room, we pray with all our hearts, Lord, that they might let go of this world. This world is sinking. This world is falling. This world is heading for destruction and judgment. God, we pray that they will let go of this world today and cling on to you. You fly. You will rise above the destruction of this world. And, Lord, you will save us all, all of us who call on your name. So, God, please now. Do a work by your Holy Spirit in the hearing of this word to produce faith. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. We are approaching this passage with questions. Three questions. And I I asked one question last week. And the question was, why Paul? Why a Jew like Paul? Uh, Paul had a, uh, a mental formulation, a framework how he saw the world, how he saw things work when it came to people. He had a pyramidal type, a pyramidal, is that a word? He had a pyramid type, yeah, it is, thank you for that. I've, given, I've been given permission that pyramidal is a word I can use. He had a pyramidal uh, uh, idea of the people of the world and God, and, and basically he saw that the Gentiles were the dregs. They were the lowest of the low on the, on the totem pole. They were the, the bottom, they were the the, the, the bottom dwellers in every way. And I keep saying they, but who are the Gentiles? We are. So I need to stop saying they. Yeah, that's, that's the way that he saw before Christ is the peoples of the world. It's rubbish. But as, as he, his conceptualization of people kind of moved up a notch, he saw the Jews as God's chosen people, special people, uh, and, and, and able to have a relationship with God. And so he kind of saw them there in the pyramid as acceptable. And then there were the top of the pyramid people. There was a people like Paul, he, and people like himself. He, they, they were serious Jews, uh, very, very devout Jews, zealous for the law. In fact, he said of himself, he, describing the way he used to see things, the way that he used to be, In Philippians 3, 5, he said, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. See, the upper upper tier, you know, the elite. In regards to the law, a Pharisee, and he just didn't get any more serious and superior than the Pharisees. And in fact, in Acts 23, he calls out to a group of Pharisees who are judging him, and he says to them, Brothers, I am the Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee trained by Gamaliel, who was the preeminent trainer, Pharisee trainer and teacher of of the day. There just wasn't anybody that could be categorized higher than where Paul was. But then he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And the formulation of how he ranked people was trashed. God sees people differently than that. And Jesus told Nicodemus, another teacher, he said, God so loved the world 
that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now those words were not spoken directly to Paul, they were spoken to Nicodemus, but Paul had access to those words. And in fact, Paul integrated those words deeply into his theology as he shared the gospel on so many occasions. And we read how Paul shared the gospel. We'll talk more about that in a second. But in light of the gospel, he stopped seeing himself as superior. In light of the gospel, he deeply regretted his racial supremacist ideology. In verse 7, he says, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Though I'm less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. Jesus died for the whole world, and Paul was his messenger to tell the Gentiles that salvation was for us too. Us too. So Paul says, don't be discouraged because of my suffering, which is your glory. Now, the next question that we're going to ask of this text is, what is the mystery? What is the mystery Sherry and looks through these, uh, where are you, baby? Uh, she's, she in the nurse, she's, she's in the nursery, isn't she? Ha-ha! Uh-huh. She's probably listening to the online thing. Everybody say, hi, Sherry. Hi, Sherry! <laughs> um, she's going to kill me. Um, it's been nice knowing you. Uh, Sherry looks over this with me before I subject you to it, and usually we catch most of the mistakes that I, the original thing uh, has, but uh, she said, didn't we talk about the mystery last week? Didn't you describe what the mystery was last week? And I, well, we're going to go deeper into that, uh, but the mystery is, in verse 3, made known by revelation, or it requires insight, and it was hidden in previous generations and ages past, verses 5 and 9. Hidden, this mystery. Mystery is the word that's used four times in these 13 verses, and it's apparent now. We can see it. We grew up singing about it. Somebody sang it to me last Sunday after church. Somebody came up to me and said, Jesus loves the little children. That's the mystery. All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. That's the mystery. And we know it. We know it. We need to know it better and we need to apply it in a, in a much more... Uh, intentional way but we know this mystery but it hasn't always been easy to see it it has been hidden in the past and i want to take you guys through some scriptures today and and i want you to do your best to follow along okay Uh, good luck but i want to take you to to zephaniah now we're not going to take time for you guys to find zephaniah no 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 okay i'm going to put this up here you just look at this We'll, we'll in a minute we'll have you turn but for now just look at this zephaniah okay In Zephaniah chapter 1, uh, verse 1, it says that the word of the Lord came to Zephaniah, son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, during the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. And then it has this, this, uh, this title over the next section. That's not actually in the scripture. It's just a title that somebody put in there, judgment on the whole earth in the day of the Lord, which is what the next passage is. About, in verse 2 it says, and I just give a a flavor for the message of Zephaniah, I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. The message of Zephaniah is a coming global judgment where God's going to destroy everything, but also a coming global salvation. And one thing I want to point out to you about Zephaniah is Zephaniah is the son of Cushy. Cushy is a name given to anybody who is a Cushite. Uh, in, uh, in the Old Testament. The Cushites, as we've discussed, are the people who live south of Egypt in modern-day Sudan, uh, and, and, and they are the African, African people. And Zephaniah's dad is an African. And so this prophet that God called is an African who now is part of the people of Israel. He's the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah. Now that's different because... Uh, you might or might not know this, but usually when you have this, these genealogies given to introduce somebody, you only get three generations. But this is fourth generation. And, and, and the reason that we have this fourth generation is because we need to understand that he is actually in the royal family. 
He is four generations removed from good King Hezekiah in the tribe of Judah. So we have this Zephaniah who is an African who's actually part of the royal family, just so you know. That's, that's who he is. But I want you to look at, at uh, his message, God's message through him, regarding the, the uh, salvation of the people of the world one day. Again, this is the mystery hidden for a long time. Zephaniah chapter 3. There it is. Uh, verse 9. God says through Zephaniah, I will purify the lips of the peoples, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him, how? Shoulder to shoulder. For beyond the rivers of where? Cush. My worshipers, my scattered people, will bring me offerings. So this is a, this is a description of the saved people who are going to come to God in the last days after judgment. And something that we need to see here, and again, we're getting a little teachy, but just work with me, people, work with me. Genesis eleven nine 9 uses the same words. The same words. Genesis eleven nine 9 says that's why it was called Babel, because there, there the Lord confused their language. It's the same word as the lips above. It was translated language instead of lips. It's kind of unfortunate in the English, but it's the same word of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the whole face of the whole earth okay lips and scattered lips and scattered lips and scattered the the next slide has the has the words it's the same words in both chapters lips is soft all. one day god is going to purify our lips so that we don't speak in confused language anymore one day we're going to be able to give his praise with with purified lips soft all. and the uh the other word scattered is the hebrew word poots Sherry is forbidden me to say anything more about that word. <laughs> but if you're in middle school, you now have your favorite Hebrew word ever, okay? But I mean, but we're talking about the lips, we're talking about scattered. And it's a direct draw back to the Babel event when God confused the people and separated the people and differentiated the people and scattered them all over the world with different languages and different words. Different, different uh, distinctivenesses. What God purposed in Genesis 11, he planned for in Genesis 12, in the calling of Abraham, by setting aside Abraham as a father of a people, a tribe, a race, to bring back the scattered peoples and races of the world. And what he purposed in Genesis 11 and planned in Genesis 12, he prophesied in Zephaniah Three, and he proclaims in Ephesians 3, verse 6. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, sharers together in the promise in Jesus Christ. That's the mystery. The mystery is that God had a plan from the very beginning to bring us all back together again in Christ Jesus. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that wonderful? Don't we have a great God and he's, he, he, he had a plan, a very, very wise plan. As we look at this verse, let's just, let's just pull the, the key words out. Gospel. What is the gospel? What is the gospel? We preach the gospel. Gospel euangelion, it means good news. What is it? Well, it's that the only Son of God, the divine Son of God, came to earth. He died for you and me and everyone on this planet to take their sins away, to pay the price for their sin. He was buried for three days and on the third day he rose again where is he now he's in heaven at the right hand of God always living to intercede for everyone who has called upon his name and genuinely given their life to him he's calling everyone all the time he's continually calling people to put their faith in him and be saved because he wants everyone to be saved and he has commissioned his believers all of us who follow him saying go go and be my witnesses all around the world, and with every chance you get, be my witnesses for him, for me, he says. And he's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back, and everyone who's genuinely surrendered their life to him will live with him forever in heaven at our great homecoming. That's what the gospel is. The Gentiles, that word there, that's the Greek word ethne, that, that's all the peoples that aren't Jews, 
we share this awesome inheritance with Israel, the chosen people, whom God communicated the gospel through and through whom he sent Jesus. And now we're one body, one promise in Christ Jesus. And Paul says, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. And to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. It's been hidden. It's been hidden. Even the Lord's most faithful people, even the Lord Jesus' best friends didn't get it at first. We're going to take a walk through the book of Acts beginning in chapter 6. Will you join me there? Acts chapter 6. Please join me there. I hear some pages turning. Thank you. A problem arose in Acts chapter 6. And that problem was that, uh, that uh, the, the church had practical matters being neglected. I won't get into all the, the, uh, the details of it. But the answer to the problem was deacons. Praise God for deacons. Amen. We have an ordination next week for some deacons. We have a whole new deacon team coming this year, and I'm, I'm thankful for our deacons. I'm excited to work with our deacons this coming year. The apostle said, Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. That's our deacons. And they chose these seven men. And one of those seven men was, was Stephen. And if you look at chapter 6 and 7, well, Stephen, God bless him, he is martyred for Christ. And that's a, that's that's. That's, that's what happened there, and his martyrdom set off a, a whole new situation for the church. In the last verse of chapter 7, we have Saul, our apostle here, approving of their killing of Stephen. If you look at chapter 8, verse 1, it says, On the day, on that day, the day of Stephen's death, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered. Throughout Judea and Samaria. If you look at Acts 8, verse 4, we have Philip. We're going to follow Philip for a minute. It says, those who've been scattered preached the word wherever they went. That's good news. So they were scattered, but everywhere they went, they were preaching about Jesus. Philip, verse 5 of chapter 8, went down into a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. Well, let me just tell you what happened in Samaria. But first off, did the Jews like Samaritans? Uh, we, if we've been to Sunday school long, we know that the, there, there was a major, major hatred for the Samaritans among the Jews, and, and, and the Samaritans likewise didn't think much of them. But Philip went. Philip was a, and I want to say this, Philip was a next generation believer. He was, a, he was not a Hebraic Jew, he was a Hellenistic Jew. He spoke Greek, he, he probably was more relaxed in, his, in the customs and his dress and the things that he did. He, he was a Jew, but he was kind of a relaxed Jew when it came to these cultural things. And so he did not have as much of a hang-up going to the Samaritans as the Hebraic Jews might have had, as the apostles did. That means that those of you who are young are likely not to have as many hang-ups prejudicially, as those who are older. Go with it. Go with that. Let God use that to build bridges to lost people. So Philip goes and he preaches the gospel. He, he doesn't even think of twice about it. He's just preaching the gospel to Samaritans. And the Samaritans are being saved. They're being healed. It's, evil spirits are going out. It's, it's a whole thing. And in verse 14 of chapter 8, it says, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. And they went up there to check everything out. And they did a little, uh, you know, fixing of things that were broken and, 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 and tidying up of some things that needed tidying up. And, but, you know, they, they had to be kind of drawn into Samaria. I, I want to tell you right now, and you need to know this, this is almost 10 years after Acts 1.8. Acts 1.8 says what? You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, it's taken them almost 10 years to get to Samaria. Why? Why? Because they stayed where it was comfortable. They stayed where their people were. The story of Philip. Philip, uh, is, we're not done with Philip. 
In verse 26, we have Philip, an angel saying to Philip, you need to go to the south road in the desert road from Jerusalem to Africa, and you need to go down there and you need to meet a man who's, who I've got you ready for. And he goes down there, he's on the road, and there's a man in a cart, and he's, he's an Ethiopian official in the... Uh, in the, in the uh, Ethiopian royal, ro, ro, he's an advisor to the Ethiopian uh, royal ro, 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 queen. <laughs> Ethiopia is the same as Cush. In the New Testament, we're speaking Greek now and not Hebrew. And so Ethiopia is the same people that the Cushites are, those people south of Egypt, down into Africa. And that man is an African man. And he's, he's going down the road and he's reading Isaiah 53 about the suffering servant, the Lamb of God who sacrificed, and he doesn't understand it, not a bit. And Philip comes up, and he starts talking to him, and he starts asking Philip questions about the passage. He says, can I explain it to you? And he does. He shares the whole gospel with that man in his cart, and they, they come across this water, and that Ethiopian man, that African man, he says, there's water. What prohibits me? Is there any rule? Is there any ba barrier? Is there any objection to... Me being baptized and becoming a follower of Jesus? And Philip said, yeah, I'm sorry, we can't accept people from Africa into this kingdom, right? Is that what he said? No, no. He said, let's go. Let's go. And he baptized him. The first Gentile convert into Christ. Some of you are going to argue with me. You say, well, what about Pentecost? Those were all Jews and Jewish uh, uh, converts to Judaism. They were not Gentiles. This is the, an African is the first convert, the first Gentile convert. Isn't that something? And then the man looked up after his baptism and Philip was gone. Where was he? Well, he kind of popped up in a couple of places, but he ended up in Caesarea. Interesting that it's Caesarea, because Caesarea is going to show up again here in a second. Are you still with me? Yes? No? Do you need a break? There's coffee. Okay, well, let's keep going. Philip, the Ethiopian eunuch, in chapter 9, verse 15 and 16, we have Paul's calling and God saying that this is the man who is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and the people of Israel. I'll show him how much he must suffer for my name, and he will suffer, but he'll be glad for the privilege to suffer for his name. Now let's look at Peter, chapter 9, verse 32. We've talked about Philip, we talked about Paul there for a minute, now let's talk about Peter. Peter, after he left Samaria, where did he go? He went back to Judea. That's what we do. We go back to comfort. We go back to the people that we can feel at home with, don't we? Peter did that. He says, he says in verse 32, as Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the Lord's people. That's Jews. <laughs> he live in Lydda. And there he found a man named Aeneas who was paralyzed, who had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, Peter said, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up, rub your mat. Immediately Aeneas got up. All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Now, in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. I wish I had put a map up here for you guys. Please forgive me for not putting a map up here for you guys. But I want you to kind of imagine kind of north. Uh, if you've got Jerusalem down here, I want you to think going up here north. Okay, let's do it opposite because you're on the other side. Okay, so Jerusalem, you go up. So here's Lydda kind of heading up towards the coast of the Mediterranean. It's, it's still in Judea. It's very Judean. But just a little bit further, there's Joppa. And Joppa's on the coast of the Mediterranean. And Joppa's a whole other story. Joppa is a very Gentile town. It, a lot of trade, a lot of ships and, and, and carts and roads go in and out. And it feels very Gentile. And so... This lady in Joppa, this disciple named Tabitha, who's always doing good and helping the poor, about that time she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. She died. This good woman died. And they washed her up and put her in the attic. And that, that's what they did. And they washed her up. She didn't giggle because she was dead. It didn't tickle. And they... Lydda, where Peter was, was near Joppa. So two of the men from Joppa ran down there and urged him, please come at once. So Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs into that room. And all the widows stood around crying and showing him robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with him. Oh, look, 
these robes. It went like that, okay? Robes. She was so good at robes. Peter sent them all out of the room. Get out of here. And then he got down on his knees and prayed, turning toward the dead woman. He said, Tabitha, get up. And she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. And he took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. And he called for the believers, especially widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. And Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. He got stuck in Joppa. He didn't want to be in Joppa. He had no intention of going to Joppa. He didn't want to be in Joppa. He didn't like those people. He didn't like that town. Didn't, didn't feel comfortable there. He wanted to get out of there and go back to Judea where he felt good. But he got stuck in a movement of God. Because people heard about what happened there and they started getting saved and stuff. And he got stuck at Simon's house, the tanner. Y'all know what tannery is? Tannery is like drying out skins and stuff and, and doing stuff with them. But it's, it's, it's a dead animal thing, right? How the Jews feel about dead animals? Man, you touch them, you're unclean for like a week. I mean, he's, he's stuck in this really, really uncomfortable situation for himself. In a town he doesn't like, in a, in a house he doesn't like, and he's, what, what, he's feeling like it's just crawling all over him. So what's he do? He goes on the roof. He's hungry. He's, God, what am I going to do? God gives him a vision. Of these sheets coming down out of heaven. These animals on that he would never eat. And said, God says, rise and eat, kill and eat. And he said, I could never, never, never. And God says, do not call unclean what I have made clean. Three times this thing happens. And then he comes to himself and there's a rattle at the door. And these guys from Cornelius... I forgot to tell you about Cornelius. He's the centurion of the Italian regiment. He's, an, he's an, a European guy. He's up there and God, an angel spoke to him. He said, we've heard all your prayers and we've seen all your good deeds and we know you fear God. Send to Simon down there at, at Simon to Tanner. Send to Peter. Send a, send a, send, go down, send your people to the house of J in Joppa, Simon the Tanner's house on a coast on Straight Street and ask for Peter and bring him back up here. And so those guys took off, and it let, took them less than 24 hours. From 3 to noon the next day, they were going. They were booking it. And they got down there, and they rattled the gate. And Peter heard them, and the angel said, go. God, oh, the Holy Spirit actually said, go, go. I've sent them. And they told what was going on. And you know, those guys made it down there in less than a day, less than 24 hours. But it took Peter three days to go back. It must have been all uphill going the other way. But I want to remind you of something. Philip was in Caesarea. Cornelius was from Caesarea. He was in Caesarea. And Philip was in Caesarea. But the Holy Spirit didn't send Philip to, or, or Cornelius to Philip. He sent him to Peter. God's not going to let Peter off the hook. And you know what? If you've got hang-ups like this, God's not going to let you off the hook either. He made Peter walk all the way up there. And meet with those people. And Peter said, verse 10, chapter 10, verse 28, You're well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate or visit with a Gentile. No, it's not. But, you know, they kind of made up their own stuff after all those years. And Cornelius told him what had happened. And Peter began to speak. He says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation. This is the mystery. The mystery is dawning on Peter. He accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ. And so Cornelius and his family are the second Gentiles to accept. And they're Europeans. One more thing I want to show you about this. This mystery. In chapter 11, verse 19. Chapter, yeah, chapter 11, verse 19. Y'all with me still? I really want you to get this. I really, really, really badly, badly, badly want you to get this. So if, you, if I lost you a second ago, come back. And look at chapter 11, verse 19. It says, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among who? The Jews. They, 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 they were prejudiced. 
They, they didn't think God loved anybody else. So even Christians are only spending time with and sharing this good news with other Jews. Some of them, however, here we go. Men from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch. This is Antioch in Syria. And began to speak to who? Greeks also. People who aren't Jews. Telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. And what was the result? The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. 2 Chronicles 6, 19 says, The eyes of the Lord range throughout the whole earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully devoted to, them, to Him. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the whole earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully devoted to Him. And here we have a church in Antioch, my favorite church in the Bible, who said, we're, we're getting over this. We're getting over this prejudice. We're getting over this us-only mentality. We're going to break out. And God rolled up his sleeve and put his hand on them and blessed them. You get that? You see how awesome that is? Who do you want to be? When it comes to being a church, who do you want to be? And I want to be Antioch with all my heart. Don't you? Pleasing to God and blessed by God like that. There's more I could tell you about that, but i got to move on. So we'll move on. But, but that's kind of the, uh, the unraveling of the mystery from being hidden to being practiced to be, okay, now we see that this gospel is for everybody. Hidden in the past. This new identity, equality, and unity we have in Christ has been hidden in the homes and lives of people, in, even in our days. Maybe in your own understanding and maybe in your own upbringing. I've had people say on many occasions, I, I was raised thinking this way. Maybe you yourself have a cloud over this racial unity that we have in Christ but look at race through the eyes of God and the provision of the gospel. Understand, now the mystery is revealed. We're all in this together. The walls are not just down, they've been destroyed. There's no barrier now. Is there any reason why I couldn't be baptized? None! Is there any reason why we can't have true fellowship with, with one another? None! There's no barrier now between peoples in Christ Jesus. None! So, in Galatians 3.26, it says, Now in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed... Have, I'm sorry. For, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And there's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave or free, nor male nor female for, your, female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Amen? Man, here Colossians 3.10 takes it a step further. Having put on the new self, which is being renewed, a new identity, is being renewed in the image of its creator. Remember, God created us in his image. All of us. Here there's no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. This new unity was unheard of in their world. I just want you to think about if you were seeing the people go to worship at the lecture hall of Tyrannus in, Ethi in uh, Ephesians. Yeah? They're seeing people gather in that lecture hall to go to worship. And there, here comes, the, here comes the, the slaves. They're all working together and talking together and enjoying it. There they go. And, and here come the the, the rich people, and they're coming. The landowners, the people with the houses, the people who are employing the slaves. Here they come. They go the same door to the same place. Here come women, women worshiping together with men. And this is not like pagan stuff. This is like, what in the world is going on? Here come barbarians, barbarians, big hairy, smelly. Barbarians, Europeans coming into the worship place 
And Scythians are worse than barbarians. They're like bad barbarians. And here they come. And you're just a Roman guy or a Greek guy in Ephesus going, what in the world is happening here? A whole new paradigm. People made one in Christ Jesus with no barriers. The world's collective mind was blown. Why, my last question, sorry I'm taking so long. Why, this is quick, why did God keep it a mystery so long? Why so long? Do you remember what God said to Job and to whom he said it in Job chapter 1? Job gives us this picture of God. It's an ancient book, Job. And we see this insight into the heavenly conversations and in the throne room that we don't see in other books necessarily. In Job chapter 1 verse 6 it says, One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the, wor- the earth, going back and forth on it. See, it's not just the eyes of the Lord who are ranging throughout the whole earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully devoted to him. The devil's eyes are also ranging throughout the earth, and he's not seeking to strengthen anybody. He's seeking to devour them. But God is having a, 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 a holding court with the angels, good and bad. And even the prince of the evil angels is there. Verse 8 says, The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He's blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. God is proud of his faithful. God delights and takes great pleasure in those who are real and really his. He brags on you. He brags on you to the heavenly beings when you're being faithful, when you're making choices that demonstrate that you love him more than your own desires, your own pleasure. Now look at Ephesians 3.10. His intent, God's plan was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is pointing at his church and he's, he's, he's praising the church He's proud of the church, his treasured possession, bought with the blood of his son. And he says, those are my people, and that is a demonstration of my wisdom, my manifold wisdom. And he's declaring his pride in the church to the heavenly beings, good and bad. That's why he took so long, because the church had to get to the place where he could brag on the church. Isn't that something? One more thing, manifold. The word manifold means of differing colors. Is that awesome? Of differing, his manifold wisdom in the church. The Greek word is poly, many, much, and number, and poikolos, meaning many diverse manifestations, meaning it's ultra diverse. God is so proud of his ultra diverse, multicolored church that he's bragging about the church to the heavenly beings. Not the heavenly beings, but the heavenly beings. Isn't that awesome? God is so proud of his beautiful church. We are his pride and joy. And this has been his plan for thousands and thousands of years. That the church in Christ Jesus would be the coming back of his family created in his image. His plan was that the church would be the coming back. The coming back. The coming back. With no barriers. Zephaniah said that we would stand shoulder to shoulder with one another, offering praise to God with purified lips. And this would be all around the throne. In verse 12 of chapter 3, Ephesians says that we will come into that throne room free and confident. Isn't that something? Revelation chapter 5 says, Jesus, you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. 
You've made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. John says, Then I looked, and I heard voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. And they encircled the throne with confidence and freedom. They circled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Are you going to be there? Are you going to be there? You're invited to be there, and there's no reason why anyone can't be there. Join the family. God wants you there in his manifold, beautiful family that he delights in. If you don't know him, accept the gospel today. Accept the gift of Jesus today. Smith Memorial Baptist Church, I want to say this to you. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the whole earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully devoted to him. We're going to be a church that he, that he is pleased in. We're going to be a church that he, he brags about to the heavenly beings. We are. We are. I didn't put this on a slide, and I'm sorry I didn't. But we're going to be that church. We're going to have no room for racial prejudice in this place. None. Zero. Zero. Okay? Now, you may be working through it, and if you want to talk about it and pray about it, that's okay. We'll talk about it. We'll pray about it. But we're just not going to practice racial prejudice here. No. No way. And we're not going to have racial bitterness. If you've, got, if you've been mistreated, you've got to give that to God. You've got to forgive for your own sake and for the Lord's church. You've got to forgive. You've got to. We're not going to have racial insecurity and feelings of low self-esteem. You've got to see your beauty in Him. You've got to. God made you who you are. And you've got to embrace that. You're beautiful. And you make this church beautiful. And if you are a racial supremacist, you need to repent and get over yourself. Amen to that? <laughs> Amen. We're going to have a moment of decision. If you'd like to join the family, if you'd like to know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, today you can come and respond and we can, we can lead you to faith in Jesus Christ here today. If you want to pray about anything else, we've got counselors that are available. Smith Church, man, let's pray that we become that church, amen, that God is so proud of. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for this day and thank you for this time. Thank you for this, this patient congregation who listened to your word today. I pray, God, that we will all take it to heart. We'll all take it to heart. So thankful to you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for revealing the mystery. Thank you, Lord, for creating the church, building your church, and God, using us. Although we're flawed, and although, Lord, we have failed, and God, we're sinners, you love us, and you forgive us, and you want to add us to your family, to your temple, to your kingdom. So God, please help us. I pray, Lord, again, for anybody who hasn't yet accepted you as Savior and Lord, Lord, help them see that today is the day. Now, Lord, we ask your spirit to move in our midst as we worship you and respond to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Won't you stand?